All right, I'm starting the recording now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, YouTube. Gay's the pin of my beautiful voice. <laughs> Don't let that distract you or, or hinder your talking in any way. So for this study, I kind of want it to be a group-driven study. So I'm just here as the sort of facilitator, maybe ask some leading questions and help you guys, most importantly, try to study the passage, discern for yourself prayerfully and spiritually what this sort of means for our lives. So with this, pretty much just imagine that we're all sort of going to the same local church, we're in the same room, sort of all huddled up in a little circle, and we all got our Bibles in front of us, and the most you'll have is a study Bible. Please don't go online, search up any answers, no gotquestions.org or anything like that. You don't want any easy answers. So I want you to sort of look through this yourself so that you can grow in that endeavor. So, so I can't use got questions. Dang it. <laughs> I specifically <laughs> called that out because it's a popular resource. All right. Yeah, just, just stick with your Bible. All right. Does anyone want to go ahead and read the passage for us? Any volunteers? Surely you can just do it yourself, Mark. I mean, I could, but I want some participation at least. Yeah, but you have a very pleasant voice. Oh, thank you. You have a pleasant <laughs> voice as well. Um, 19 through, 30 through 31. One? Yeah. All right, I'll read it. Okay, this is out of the ESV. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Perfect. So again, with this study, I want to sort of bounce ideas off of you and have you guys bounce ideas off of each other. You can comment in the study VC, the text channel, if you want. But rather, I'd, I'd prefer a microphone. Obviously, try to be respectful. You can give your opinions. If you have a question you'd like to pose to the group, then you can do that as well. So I think the first question that I want to go with is that, is this a parable that Jesus is telling, or is this a historical event? Oh dear, that's a fun one. <laughs> so if, if I may give my take here, and I'm a bit uh, biased here because we had a sermon about this uh, a few weeks ago, but the usual take you'll find in conservative circles is that this is a real-life story, and the reason people give to point to that is Lazarus is named, and that is hmm. very uncommon in parables. But I, I, I would object to that because, one, Lazarus is a very meaningful name, and probably the, the Hebrews would have interpreted uh, Lazarus as a kind of stock character. You know, we have, um, for example, John Doe. But I wouldn't say that the character John Doe has the name John Doe. It's just a kind of stock trope that's being used. And I, I would say that Lazarus fits in that same uh, role. That aside, I think it is rather unlikely that um, a flaming pit of fire and brimstone would allow Mr. Uh, Richman here to speak <laughs> coherently still. And even more importantly, I cannot imagine that we will be able to converse with the damned in, ha in, ha in, uh, in heaven. So those three things, I would say, are pretty strong evidence that this is a parable. But of course, that does not make the teaching more, uh, that does not make the teaching less poignant. It just means that it's not literal. Sure, certainly. Those are good points there. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Or maybe a different opinion? 
think, parable too. All right. Yeah, on the note when Ubo said that it was very uncommon for someone to be named in a parable, this was actually the only instance in any parable that someone is named, but I believe he is correct in saying that it was a meaningful name. Lazarus is the Greek form of Eleazar, and it means he whom God has helped. Just another note as well on the, the parable thing. Luke actually, in this particular gospel, he records Jesus as starting out six other parables with there was a, a rich man or a man or a woman in the same sort of Greek phrase. So that's another sort of point where we can say that this might be a parable or at least pointing to that. All right. So does anything stand out to anyone just in general? Any observe, observations from this passage? They might have thought, oh, that was pretty interesting while you were reading through it. Uh, the fact that the guy is basically in hell and can see heaven. Yeah, that is I certainly I thought that was really, yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, so Ubo mentioned that, you know, this probably isn't the, the way things happen in reality. So I guess maybe we could sort of consider this as a, a mechanic of the parable just to keep conversation going. So on that note, people can talk with each other between hell and paradise, or Hades and paradise, apparently. But, you know, what, what's the point of all of this? Why, are they, why can they talk to each other? Why can they do, they do this and that? So why is Jesus giving this parable? What's the point he's trying to make? One thing that came to my mind... Oh, you can go ahead, Sarka. Don't worry, go ahead. Okay. Well, one thing that came to my mind while I was reading the story was the passage in Matthew where Jesus said, like, he was talking in the passages, Matthew 25, 41, um, uh, see, Matthew 25, verse 44 through 45 says, Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So, like, the overall message of the story just really brings that passage to mind. Yeah, that's a good one. Because Lazarus, you know, he's just sitting at the gate, and apparently the rich man actually knows him by name, but he hasn't really done anything for Lazarus. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so we can see that from the... That, that's the sort of message Jesus is trying to uh, put here. But what brought this parable up in the first place? You know, why is Jesus bringing this parable up? What's the context of it? It's in response to something. Come on, chaps. Come on, chaps. Um, well, Luke uh, 16, 14, uh, so just the page before, says, The Pharisees, who are lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. So I'm assuming it pointed at the Pharisees and them being lovers of money. Perfect, yes. And just before that, there was the parable of the dishonest manager, which was kind of in a similar vein as the rich man and Lazarus, which is another pointer that this is probably a parable. But yeah, that's the context I was getting at, Luke 16, 14 to 15. And especially Luke 16, 13 is another good one. You could probably sum up the message as, you are not able to serve God and money. And the, the Pharisees ridiculed him, of course. And so after a short little interlude on divorce, Jesus goes into this other story about the rich man Lazarus to really sort of seal the deal with it. So any thoughts so far? Just could be on anything. All right, we'll just keep continuing. So we know why Jesus is giving this parable, and we sort of know the message behind it with that cross-reference that Brie gave. So the next question is, you know, the structure of this parable. Does the rich man represent anyone and who and why? Our desire says he represents Bezos. Bezos. <laughs> oh, yeah. I really thought you were going for a biblical character. <laughs> I was so confused. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't disagree. All right, so that, that's some sort come on, of Come on, chap. Say something. Contribute. Use your brain. Some great encouragement from Ubo. Yeah, yes, thank I, you. I am so very that encouraging. It's very motivating. <laughs> I love... Very motivating. Thank you. <laughs> so Desire is already looking for applications where we can, you know, use this passage to any rich man. But did Jesus have any specific rich men in mind? And why? 
is just in the previous context. Yes, the Pharisees. Bloody fun. <laughs> so with the Pharisees in mind, you know, in the immediate context, so we can draw some, some more connections. Specifically, I'm looking at near to the end here, you know, starting at verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, they must listen to them. Then 31, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rises to the dead. So I can't really think of any other way that this is sort of like a, like a jab at the Pharisees in those last verses that Jesus is throwing at them. So another question that I want to look at is, you know, we saw from that cross, cross reference from Matthew that we're sort of looking at, well, you know, you shouldn't neglect the poor. You shouldn't do this or that. You should care for them. You should provide for them and help, help them and things like that. But the rich man didn't do that. And he was sentenced to Hades. Now, obviously, if we take that at face value, we might have some difficulties with, uh, you know, a justification by faith alone sort of theology. So what actually condemned the rich man to Hades? It wasn't a socialist. That was desired, by the way. He just deleted his message just for context. So what condemned the rich man, though? I don't know if I'm correct, but in verse 25, when Abram says, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, but likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. It reminded me of... Um, where Jesus says that, um, like to store your treasures in heaven and not on earth because, hmm. right, like, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know it verbatim, but it's something like those who have nothing will lose, right? And those who have a lot will gain more. And he was talking about, it was in Matthew, he was talking about your treasure being like your salvation and not your riches. Nice. Yeah. It's a good point. I like the contrast there in that verse as well. And Desire's got some comments too. His lavish living without considering others. People are condemned by their works. They're not saved by their works though. Another very good point there. So we can see that he's sort of, he's condemned by his works. And have a nice, nice day, Zach. So he's condemned by his works, which were bad. And, you know, obviously he, he wasn't saved. Otherwise he would have helped out Lazarus who was right there at his gate. Another good thing to note is that this isn't really, you know, a good passage to gain a salvific message from because the point of the passage is to show condemnation by serving wealth instead of God. And that's what we can assume that the rich man is doing here. He's been rejecting God. It also says that apparently implied he has rejected Moses and the prophets just like his brothers have so on and so forth. And that's what we can glean from his condemnation, why he was condemned there. Any final final thoughts or any questions on this passage before we sort of move on? Could be about anything, anything that stood out to you. One thing that just stood out to me was like the end passage where it says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And just how like, a lot of people nowadays will say like, oh, I would believe in Christianity if I saw like some miraculous sign. But the Bible points out that if the Bible isn't enough, then nothing is going to change their mind. Hmm. Yeah, that's perfect. I would call that out as a, another big secondary point to the passage. Any other thoughts? More thoughts on that if you got comments on that last verse there. Oh, and we're in Luke sixteen nineteen to 31 chaos. So weird saying people's usernames. <laughs> All right, just to sum up then, we have this parable or story, if you prefer a real story, if you'd like. Uh, this story told by Jesus in response to the Pharisees who were lovers of money and who ridiculed his previous parable. So it goes on, there's a rich man, there's Lazarus, and they're contrasted with each other. And the rich man ignores Lazarus and apparently serves God rather than money. And they're both carried to their respective places. The rich man carried, or it just says he was died and buried. But it says the poor man was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side to sort of give him that favor. And there's this chasm between them in Hades and paradise. And the rich man is suffering. And he wants to warn his brothers about this torment. 
And Desire puts in a nice question there. Did the rich man suddenly decide to care for others when he went to Hades? What do you guys think? Um, what are Bible passages that back up concept that we only have this life to either accept or reject God, to respond to desire the great thing that we have more of a chance after we die? Hmm, interesting point. One day we'll get more people in the actual voice channel. Well, like somebody pointed out earlier, <laughs> tends to be mostly introverts. Introverts would be less comfortable with voice chat <laughs> with a bunch of other people. <laughs> it's all right. I have to force myself a little bit. Desire the Great, you're helping my argument against you. <laughs> the other thing I would point out to that is, although it is a parable, it specifically calls out a great chasm between the two. And apparently no matter how much the rich man wanted to, at least at the time, he was not able to go over to the other side. Sure, but the very fact that I can still communicate probably points to this not being exactly real history. Imagine having a conversation with Hitler in heaven. I can't imagine that this is going to be very peaceful. <laughs> I can't imagine that either. Um, Desire the Great, are you making sure that you're interpreting that verse in light of the verse surrounding it and the rest of the Bible and what it says? Make sure that it means what... Mark, shall we attempt to not let this degenerate into a annihilationism versus eternal torment discussion? <laughs> I wasn't really expecting that, but this is... You know, a pretty open Bible okay. study. Free to give your no, opinions. Or we can stick to the main... I mean, sure, but I, I don't think yet another debate is going to be very constructive here. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't want to go all the way over there. It is slightly relevant, though, as far as the great chasm is concerned. I don't see how this discussion in particular is, would turn into annihilationism because, really, I would say it just has to do with do we have any second chances after this life? That, that's what's up for debate, not... Annihilationism. Yeah. Different. At least that's where I thought he was going. Yeah. All right. Well, one last call for any other thoughts, you know, out of a different vein from what we were just talking about. Any other thoughts that you thought were interesting? And then we'll sort of move on to the final phase. You believe in you, Mark. Um, um, so I have a thought. Uh, my mom, you know those videos, they're all over YouTube of people saying they went to hell or they went to heaven and, <laughs> and God brought them back and now they're here to the us. I did not my, know that. Yeah, my mom hey, always hey. uses this passage to say that it's unbiblical because no one can go to heaven or go to hell and then come back to warn us. Hmm. What do you guys, yeah. like, what do you think about that? Well, I, I actually would not be that uh, dogmatic. Obviously, first, the, we have the example of Jesus Christ. Second, we have Paul, who was taken up to the third heaven. I can't quite remember the, the specific epistle, but I think Mark on what I'm talking about, right? He talks about a vision where he called up in the third oh, heaven. Yeah. But Im immediately thereafter, he said that he was commanded not to share what he saw there. Right. So, I, I think a, a vision, okay, kind of, I, I will go there, but physically going to hell and then coming back somehow is not cool especially when the theology in those uh, testimonies tends to be extremely wacky i remember reading one where she actually said that we are saved by works yeah and yes if anything that they said when they return so to speak is against the bible then we know it's not true exactly mm, very good point. i mean we would not believe even if someone came back uh but the only gentleman would not believe even if someone came back from death to tell them, as the verse informs us. So, yeah, I, I don't understand how people can take this stuff seriously, but I suppose uh, it's not the only thing that's weird about humanity. Any, right. if any, Satan has any avenue of deceit. He has countless, so it will work for some, and so therefore he has it happen, right? Because it's not like people are like coming to Christianity in droves because of these testimonies. True. So Desire has another interesting question in there. Where did Lazarus come back from? Not this Lazarus, I'm, I'm sure. The, uh, the other Lazarus that was named who Jesus rose from the dead. Before everybody is resurrected, aren't we... I don't know, like I haven't really studied very much, but aren't we all like in holding before the Day of Judgment? So he was wherever or just... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not very familiar with exactly what happens you know most people are just like you go to heaven but i guess it's not exactly that and so hmm, yeah i don't know if anybody studied it more like that we're all waiting you know because the bible talks about that we're waiting to all be resurrected and like some will before 
when Jesus returns? I don't know. This is a lot that I don't know about right. yet. So, uh, so yeah. when the Bible speaks about hell, and you, you have to forgive my pronunciation here, it's, it's horrible. It's either Sheol or, or Hades in, uh, in the New Testament, or Gehenna, and those are both fairly allegorical names. And you are right, they refer to a kind of raising room that will be poured into the lake of fire itself at the Last Judgment. In regards to heaven, there are actually a couple of ways you could interpret this. Of course, we have the, uh, the thief on the cross who will be in paradise with Christ today, so some kind of paradise already has to exist, but there are, are differences on opinion or on if this paradise is actually heaven itself, or if it is some kind of waiting room, as you said. So hell is definitely a waiting room. It will be cast into the lake of fire along with everything else that is sinful. As for heaven, well, either the, par the paradise comes before heaven and we will be let into the heavenly city thereafter, and if you read Revelation, you could make an argument for that. Or uh, the soul is already let into heaven and will be reunited with the body at the last judgment. That's also a position you could take. So the Bible's not entirely clear on this, but there are definitely indications. Yeah, I yeah, would agree with guess, that. Yeah, go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, and that's okay. And maybe some of what, like, another thought to have is that we're within linear time and everything has already uh, occurred within eternity. And so <laughs> we have an understanding. So, like, that comes into play as well. But I don't see any benefit of, like, libertarian free thinking. will destroy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically, it is sort of a, a waiting room. That's what Hades and Sheol is, basically. And the believers huh. do automatically go into what the Bible says is God's presence. So what that looks like exactly today, we're not really sure. But it's also sort of a waiting room in the sense that we're waiting for the new heaven and new earth as described in Revelation. But on the day of the final judgment, both believers and non-believers will be resurrected. Out of Hades will come the non-believers and they'll be thrown into Gehenna, which is described in Revelation as the lake of fire, the sort of hell proper that we're we're more familiar with. It's also interesting because it's mentioned that in the parable about Hades, although it's also described with fire as well. In verse 24, I'm suffering pain in this flame. So I'm not exactly sure. Maybe this could be, for parables purposes, referring to actual, actual Gehenna, because if I'm familiar with, maybe someone can correct me on this, I'm familiar with most descriptions of Hades for non-believers as just sort of outer darkness, you know, a place of gnashing teeth, but it's not really described with flame as Gehenna is. So just some really interesting thoughts there, I think. I'm just waiting for Desire to finish typing there. Yeah, good interesting, good points there. That's, that's pretty much why I chose this passage, because it's Makes for some interesting discussions. All right. Like jumped right in, in on the first Bible study. <laughs> Tougher stuff. <laughs> yeah. So Sorry, we've. Come on, Mark. Yeah. I'll go into the, the final phase, as I call it. We've pretty much gotten a decent understanding of the passage, what the message means, sort of why Jesus is giving us this passage. But the question now is you know, it's not good enough to just gain a a materialistic knowledge of the passage or more wisdom from it, it's good to apply it to our lives. So we know what the message is and we know the point Jesus is making. Now how can we apply this to our lives? What parts can we apply it to our lives? Eat your vitamins so you don't die. Vitamins for This is the most perfect interpretation I've ever encountered. <laughs> Flawless. Alright, yeah, I'll, I'll give the give some direction here. So we know that the rich man favored wealth. He served wealth instead of God, and he neglected Lazarus at his gate. So, you know, what what do we learn from this? What should we do in our own lives? Not allow money to become an idol. Nice, yeah. Don't allow money to become your idol. Anything else? Steer clear of the prosperity gospel. <laughs> um, we are to help those who need help. Yeah, exactly. Now, how do we uh, do that exactly? Like, what are some specific examples of putting that into practice that you could literally do within the week or the month? Well, the easiest one is monetary support, but actually physically helping would be to figure out what kinds of ministries hopefully your church is a part of and you, you know, volunteer with that or volunteer out in your community, even if it's not directly related yeah, with your true. church. And that way you can hopefully be around people who witness you in that case. Hmm. Any other ideas? 
Um, so my mom always, like, she's always encouraging all of us to make ourselves useful. Like, if there's no work, look for work to do. And so I've always, like, approached that in that way of, like, trying to see, well, what can I do even in my immediate neighborhood? Actually, in my town, it's a really small town, there's this elderly man he's like 70 something and he's a retired french teacher and he he walks around our town he can hardly walk and he just like picks up trash and he's been doing this for like 20 years now since he's been retired so i mean even little things like that i think means something to somebody yeah that's a good point that you made earlier too if we're not observing around us and we're not being observant you know, we're going to miss these opportunities and we won't be able to apply this passage properly. All right, so that was one of the main messages there. I think the other one that we can apply, and maybe you could find another one, but the other message that I think we can apply is the rich man's warning. His was a specifically a warning to his brothers that they might not experience such torment. But how, you know, I think it's also a warning for us. So how can we... I also applied this passage and part of the verse to our lives. Because there's certainly torment involved in here, and it would be dishonest on the part of the, even if it's just a parable, if there wasn't any corresponding reality to this torment. It would just be fear-mongering if, it, if there wasn't really torment. So I'm thinking along the lines of evangelism specifically. What can we do to you know, help bring the gospel to people? Desire is just full of great ideas today. I just trust Jesus has two friends who she's already shared the gospel with, but were pretty unresponsive. Does anyone have any advice or thoughts on that? Yeah, we don't always see immediate responses, but that does not mean that we're to, even though it's easy to lose heart uh, with not seeing that, um, stay with it and show them Jesus' love. And in time, God can absolutely change their hearts. So you may not see anything immediately, but in the long term, you may have that blessing and that privilege. Or you may never, but we're to look to, you know, we're to do what we're supposed to do, um, whether we get to see the fruit of our results or not. So just stick with it. I know it's tough though when you don't see when you don't see feedback from your efforts. <laughs> but mm, very true. I guess part of the issue is not wanting to come off as pushy. Yeah, that's another good point. Sometimes we might have sort of those inhibitions. Yeah, and especially because some people are like more resistant or less interested in hearing about Jesus than others. And if they're especially resistant, then just hope for opportunities to come up where they may ask something or where you can say something, something that's, you know, truthful about God, but that is not directly like, but I don't know, scripture is really important. So even if you just say, like, say a verse or something from a verse, but you don't say where it's from, even, um, you know, because God's word can do anything. Um, so that kind of thing, or, um, yeah, I, I don't know, I had another thought, but I, it'll probably come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Well, good point from Desire. You don't have to convince them all at once. Sometimes you just have to put a stone in their shoe, make them think that God mm -hmm. is real, that the soul is a non-physical body. Yes, a pebble, exactly. I've heard that concept before, a pebble in the shoe that, that will make them think. You know, mm. something will happen and they'll think back to something you said. And so just planting little seeds and that, that can be a beginning. So. Yeah, that's great imagery. All right, so we've... Desire the great. Oh, yeah. That is a great point right there, too. So we've looked at the passage, and we've sort of discerned a good meaning for and why this passage is given, why Jesus is giving us this story, the context around that, and we've even got some applications there for our lives does anyone have any absolutely final thoughts or ideas, anything that you thought was really interesting or a question you wanted to pose to the group before we head out? Oh, that's just something he does, Hat. He just deletes all his messages so he doesn't leave an internet footprint. Okay. <laughs> I think he was typing something earlier, though, so I'll, I'll wait for him to finish typing. If he's got a final thought. That he will then delete. <laughs> We have no record of him. We don't even know if he exists. Yeah, no, no record in the log. <laughs> All right, so that's a good question. So why can't God make himself more obvious to us so that we don't go to Hades? That is 
not an easy question. There's this book I've been wanting to read, but then there's a gazillion books I want to read. But it's about um, God being invisible, like just that he is, he is not really detectable to our five senses. And so, yeah, I don't know. That's, I haven't read the book yet, so I really no. would not, <laughs> can't really answer. I actually don't think it would matter because I think back in the Old Testament when God's presence was very much known and people still didn't care, they still sinned hmm. and true. went their own way. Very true. That's a very good point. And then the New Testament indicates that we do have enough visible proof of God um, that we're responsible for. And so, um, so even though it's not... So it may be that we expect things, but the reason we expect them is more about not wanting to be responsible to God instead of not having like a fair, quote unquote, fair amount of evidence or proof, because God says we do have that. So Yeah, very true. Just in the passage, I'll just say verse 31 again. If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. And I really like that example from the Old Testament that Trust Jesus used as well. I think that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's pretty much it for the study. I really enjoyed this today, and I'm thankful for the participation and the great thoughts and discussions that we had throughout. Well, there will be one next week, Micah. Goodbye, chaps. Thank you for leading this. This was really good. Oh, yeah, no yeah, problem. Thank you. Does anyone want to close us out with a word of prayer? All right. <laughs> Perfect. I will. Dear Lord, thank you for another day that you have given to us. And thank you that we are so easily able to gather together as Christians these days. Um, thanks to advancements like the Internet. And thank you for... Uh, the desire that you give people to gather together and to share your word with each other. And uh, Lord, I just pray for everybody that was here and everybody on the server, Lord, um, for any not saved, they will come to know you. And for any of us are, Lord, that um, that you will continue to work in our lives um, to um, push us more to be like your son. And Lord, I pray that everybody has a good rest of their evening or day, <laughs> depending on where they are. Lord, thank you for who you are and what you did for us and what you do for us. And I ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to go get some schoolwork in. I'll probably have That's a have passage <laughs> reference soon for the next week's Bible study. And I'll make an announcement for cool. that.